Um, my name is Anya Gregory. I work on behalf of the Sherpa Project in the communications section, communications dissemination and advocacy, and I currently also work for the European Business Summit. We're joined also by Bernd Stahl. Bernd, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, hello. Um, my name is Bernd Stahl. I'm a professor at De Montfort University, which is in Leicester in the UK. And uh, I've been doing research for a long time around ethical aspects of information technologies. I lead a research group called the Center for Computing and Social Responsibility. And as part of that work, um, I'm also coordinating the Sherpa project. Well, thank you so much. Uh, well, yes, thank you for joining us. Uh, Jana Toom is a member of European Parliament, uh, as well as, you know, being a part of many committees that are related to the work. Uh, we're just very, we're, we're happy that you're here uh, in that policy role as well. So, to begin, I think it would be good to just have a little introduction to the Sherpa project, uh, just to share with you a bit more outside of the recommendations themselves about the full scope of the four-year project. Uh, and I would like to invite Bernd to, to give a, a little preface to that, if you would, Bernd. Okay. So Sherpa is a uh, three and a half year project. It's a, an EU funded project uh, that's been running since May 2018. We have 11 partners from seven different countries covering uh, a range of stakeholders, um, research institutions, uh, companies, third party um, uh, bodies, as well as standards bodies. Um, and what we are interested in is uh, ethical and human rights aspect of AI and big data. So we, we've used the term smart information systems to cover the the breadth of the AI technologies and the uh, big data analytics um, challenges. What we've done so far is we've done a bunch of em empirical investigations trying to find out how these technologies currently play out in practice. So we've done case studies, we've uh, done scenario analysis, we've done Delphi studies, we've done uh, surveys. Um, we have reached out to various stakeholders. We have a, a stakeholder board. Uh, we have uh, done a number of focus groups. We have um, had workshops. And so we've tried to, to talk to as many people as we can. Um, we have thought about what can be done about these things. So we've looked at standardization options, regulation, uh, the creation of a regulator, uh, technical aspects. And now uh, we are at the point where we've um, sort of shaped our ideas of recommendations that would make sense. And uh, we're now reaching out to people like yourself uh, to get feedback on whether these recommendations make sense, how they resonate with the current discourse, and how we can best promote them. Okay, uh, thank you. I, I would lie if I would say that I read all these 300 pages, but most of them. And frankly speaking, when uh, I saw the question, you know, what can you add? I'm, I'm afraid I can add nothing, or you basically did everything. Uh, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not kidding, you know, you did. Uh, but, you know, uh, in terms of political work, of course, the big challenge will be to, uh, to reach the politicians, you know. For, as a rule, we do not read the pages of uh, 300, uh, papers of uh, 300 pages long. So that will, that will be definitely a challenge. Yeah. I have to say that I share 100%, uh, maybe even more, uh, what you did. But I'm not very optimistic when I look at the discussions in the parliament. You know, this level of competence of decision makers is uh, quite uneven, I would say. Well, it's, it's great that you took the time to, to read uh, all of those pages. So thank you so much. Not all, uh, not all. Some of them. No, but of course, I mean... No, we had, we had crazy weeks, so I just didn't have time for all. But of course, my, my assistant did and I also, I also had a look at them. Yeah, and at the end of the day, it's it's really about reading what's relevant to you, and uh, and let's discuss it and and see what we can come out with today as well as a as a result of the discussion. So, um, may, maybe perhaps we will begin with the first recommendation. That is the recommendation we've come up with about regulatory framework and the enforcement mechanism for AI. I know that you're in the Committee for Justice, Civil Liberties and uh, Home Affairs, so perhaps it, it relates a bit from that angle to you. You really think that the European Commission and the European Parliament and also the Council should set a, a strong legal standard at the EU level that establishes a baseline and encourages uh, high standards. We also think that we need to develop some kind of a mandatory regulatory framework to ensure that AI systems are safe 
and specifically to ensure that they do not violate human fundamental human rights and ethical principles. So um, my first question to Jana would be, you know, why do you think we need a, a regulatory framework for AI and what are some key issues that need to be addressed in this framework? Basically, you mentioned the key issues if you look from the point of uh, human rights, data protection and these kind of things. But I would say that, you know, uh, I'm not in favor of very strong regulation. Uh, first, uh, I, I'm not very optimistic that it is doable. Well, as you know, uh, finding consensus, reaching consensus in European Union is not an easy thing. And this intergovernmental uh, European Union just doesn't work in a proper way. We all see that every day in every field. So I believe that we still have some member states who will say, no, Brussels will not dictate to us how to do. If you look, for instance, at, I don't know, Corona tracing apps, uh, how they are developed in, I don't know, in Estonia, in Belgium, or in Poland. These are very different approaches, really. My, my son lives in Poland, so I know that every time when, when he gets an SMS, he has to get out and to make selfie in front of his house with the address on it. This is not normal, I would say. And it, yes, what I want to say, uh, this is ambitious goal, but I don't believe that this is uh, doable, okay, in upcoming, I don't know, five, seven years. Uh, and uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, my concern is that if we regulate it really uh, with hard regulation, uh, we can create obstacles uh, for we just are not able to understand now, okay, Maybe not, not me, I, I am not uh, able, but I don't believe that anybody can predict what is the future of AI in, in upcoming years. And there is, you know, as we are quite slow in our legislation, we are kind of constantly lagging behind. Then let's say we'll, we will regulate something on the day X, and in three years we'll find ourselves in an absolutely new situation. This legislation is not relevant anymore due to very uh, fast development of this sector, and uh, we are in super situation. So I would, uh, I would go for kind of combined thing like the European legislation and self-regulation. I'm a former journalist and I really believe in all kinds of uh, codes of conduct. It works. It really works. So uh, I would not rely only on self-regulation, but some combined approach uh, seems um, kind of more, more, more doable and more logical for me. And why do we need it? For, you know, if we look at some countries, I don't want to compare us with anybody. I don't know. Let's look at China. What miracles are they doing with their AI? I believe nobody of us uh, wants to find ourselves one day in, in the same environment. Um, yeah, go ahead, Bert. Yeah, if, if I could just um, re respond to, to the, the question of uh, the limitations of regulation. I mean, we are fully aware of that, of course. Technology moves fast. Uh, regulation not necessarily. Uh, so, so the way we've tried to structure the proposal for what we think should be regulated is really to uh, suggest something that is flexible, that's adaptable. So not to say this is what you do and this is what you don't do, but to uh, create what we call an ecosystem of AI where there is the possibility of uh, flexibly reacting to challenges. So uh, we don't know what the next generation of AI will do to fundamental human rights. But what we think should be there are mechanisms that allow highlighting these things uh, that support the research and the awareness, but that also allow um, to interact and, and to, to react, to uh, do something uh, which, which is required. And that's why we, for example, uh, proposed um, an EU agency for AI. Uh, that would be a, an agency that can develop with the technology, that can um, come up with appropriate responses, um, depending on, on where exactly the technology goes. Yes, uh, sorry, sorry to intervene without invitation. Uh, this is very logical, exactly. You know, for uh, as I said, the uh, competence of decision makers is very uneven, and we really need we really need some body which deals only with this kind of things. As a rule, I'm not in favor of creating all new kind of agencies. For you know, sometimes the old ones do not work properly, and then instead of uh, doing better, we just create something new. But in this case, it would be absolutely logical. Uh, but there is another concern for me, you know, uh, these things like a AI itself, they have to be kind of understandable to a certain extent at least. And if we create some uh, body dealing with AI, there is a certain danger that you will be far like, you know, on the moon with some uh, life and decision makers making which nobody understands. So 
So you have to think about communication really well then. Yes, yes, I fully agree with that. I mean, that's actually, uh, it's a separate recommendation of ours, but the, this uh, agency uh, would have communication as, as one of its uh, key remits. You know, there is an important task to be done to communicate. And it also, of course, feeds in with uh, training, education, and, and this sort of activity. Yeah, we will touch on education a little bit later, but uh, definitely uh, really good things to consider. So would there be any other kinds of enforcement mechanisms that you would see as uh, relevant to support this outside of what we've discussed with uh, self-regulation and poten potentially creating an agency? Uh, you know, I, I, I'm not dealing with this. Uh, in previous mandate, uh, when I was in Committee of Education and Culture, uh, I had this AVMS, all this uh, copyright directive, that I was kind of closer to this kind of things. Now I'm not. But, uh, uh, and uh, I'm not able to look at the whole spectrum, but definitely we need to be very active in education. I, I, I've heard that you, uh, you are planning to, to speak about it later. But, you know, the thing is that we, uh, we have no digital skills. Uh, in some countries, we don't even have proper internet connection and so on and so forth. So this is definitely the thing which, which we have to, uh, to deal with. And we had to deal with yesterday already, but we did not for some reason. Uh, so education is definitely one of them. And uh, uh, I wanted to ask, sorry, I know that this is my interview. I mean, you are interviewing me, not vice versa. But still, I've just read Estonian news and some, some other news, you know, all this kind of conspiracy theories. I don't know, these people who don't wear, want to wear masks, who don't want to vaccinate, or for we are, I don't know, tracing them. Do you, uh, do you see that it also, uh, something like that concerning uh, artificial intelligence? Oh, absolutely, yes. Uh, I, I think, uh, I mean, there are there's sort of a, a, a general um, skepticism towards science and, and uh, received wisdom of, of, of the, uh, what you call the, the, the epistemic ortho orthodoxy, so you know, the, what the universities say and so on. Um, which, you know, and, and that's, I think, where, where uh, I would put this skepticism about vaccination. Um, but I think in particular with regards to AI, this raises even bigger questions because it, it uh, stokes people's fear. Um, you know, there, there's, if you look at the discussion on ethics of AI, there, there are some very practical questions such as data protection, security of the system. There are some bigger societal questions such as you know, employment, education, uh, democracy. And then there are those big uh, anthropological, philosophical, theological questions. Will these things ever become conscious? Uh, will they take over from us? And I think there's, there's a big fear, and that's, that's been around for a long time, and, and we've seen that in, in science fiction for decades, uh, and I think that also plays part in, in the public perception. Uh, uh, so that's the why I asked. I was thinking that, uh, I don't know, maybe regulation is the wrong word there. I don't know, we really need to build a trust. To build a trust, we, uh, we I believe, need to be as ethical as possible. Uh, but uh, uh, ethic is not the thing that we can uh, impose by legislation. And uh, uh, it will take time, of course, you know, if new technology comes, uh, kind of new rules, new ethical rules are, are not there still. And it will take time, of course, it's the build of trust. Uh, so uh, yeah, this, will be, this will be a great challenge. I don't know, in medicine, for instance, and uh, in, in whatever spheres of life. And of course, et ethics is by definition uh, more contested than law, for example. Uh, so so we, we don't necessarily always agree on what's the right thing to do and, and what's the ethical thing to do. Um, but I, th uh, I mean, part of what we've done in Sherpa is to highlight what the discussions are at the moment. So what do people perceive to be ethical issues? Why do they perceive them to be ethical issues? Um, and one of the things uh, we're also proposing is to integrate uh, ethics by design as a methodology into the technology development so that um, the people who actually do the, the nitty gritty, the nuts and bolts, who do the programming and, and build the hardware, that they have an understanding of what people are concerned about. And that does not guarantee that we'll all agree on what's right and what's wrong, but it does uh, hopefully increase the, the chance that there will be inter intelligent conversations about it. You're right, but people do not necessarily act uh, not ethically due to the fact that they just don't know what is ethical. That's true. This, true, this is true. about knowledge, right? This is about something. Uh, else. Absolutely, an old problem of, of, of philosophy, yes. Uh, but if they don't know what they're talking about, then they have no chance uh, to do the right thing. Whereas if they do, that doesn't guarantee that they will. But at least uh, uh, it, it's a step in a necessary condition, but not a sufficient one. 
this also brings to mind the issue of transparency and uh, you know being able to have these open and frank conversations about these subject matters as well. Uh, okay, should we perhaps move on then to the education side of things and start discussing the next recommendation, which is about you know education, but also uh, specifically about creation of training and education pathways uh, that include ethics and human rights of AI. So uh, our recommendation is that the teaching of digital competences as it currently is, needs to be coupled with more of a teaching of ethical and human rights aspects. So um, first of all, it appears that you're in favor of this, Iana, but, uh, but why do you think it's so important when it comes to, to the future of, of these future technologies? Uh you know, we just discussed why is this important. You know, if it comes to any new technologies, this ethic uh, is not there yet. And of course, there is a irresistible temptation to use your knowledge uh, in, let's say, strange ways. Uh, but uh, I, I was born in Soviet Union uh, and uh, we lived in socialism. And uh, I was uh, at school, I learned that Mongolia uh, came from feudalism, uh, from, from feudalism directed to socialism without capitalism. You know, just that it was kind of big success. They didn't have capitalism. Uh, and when I'm listening to you, I have a little bit the same, you know, um, feeling, sorry. You know, you are speaking that we need to uh, stay uh, with the digital education like it is and just add something there. But basically we don't have digital education yet. I mean, we do not. We don't even have definition of uh, uh, European definition of who is IT teacher at school. These are just random people who uh, don't have uh, necessary skills to teach somebody. This is the problem. And uh, I understand that you are, where you are dealing with, you're on the next step already, which is also needed. But I'm not able now to, uh, you know, to follow your discussion on that, for I know that if, we, uh, like I already mentioned, in Italy, we have 25% uh, of schools with no internet connection. I highly, and crucifies uh, everywhere, you know, I, I highly doubt that they will teach uh, AI in, I don't know, 10 years from now. This is a problem. And uh, uh, now uh, the challenge is how to reach these people. Mm -hmm. Because education is uh, the, uh, at school, of course, at school, at universities. My daughter is uh, learning uh, in Leuven University uh, uh, AI, and they have obligatory course of ethics. But, you know, we have to reach these people who are doing it at home with no, I know, no any connection with educational, uh, what schools, whatever. This is, this is a huge challenge. But how to do it, I have no idea. So you're, you're touching on the informal learning aspects, which I think is, is definitely interesting. Um, the fact that also we're in a global pandemic and a lot of children or young people do not have connection to the internet, of course, is, is, a, is a huge issue. And, and the fact that we have a lot of digital uh, illiteracy, we could say, is especially issue. We are indeed on that next step where we're looking to, to um, a society where that is already a kind of a given, but it is important to mention that it, it isn't a given everywhere. So, yeah. What kinds of training do you think then we should be adding uh, to the curriculum? Yeah, you mentioned informal learning. Uh, do you think it should start actually at a really young age? Um, what kinds of things would you envision as a next step? I know I very, I very much uh, love this Finnish model. Uh, they, they started with integrating all kinds of digital uh, things uh, like 40 years ago uh, i mean we, we didn't we didn't uh, think about that and they already started they have very interesting conception of education and they uh, they don't have like separate uh, subjects on um, it or something like that they just have these parts in in each and every subject which is which is really great uh, and uh, so for me this is kind of almost ideal model i would say for, you know, uh, especially for young people who are used to uh, get information from the internet, from computer, from cell, not from paper books, of course. Yeah. And uh, uh, absolutely different approach. So this is, it is fun. And my, my own son went here in Brussels to one wonderful school and I see that 
he's just she just enjoy the learning for they they do it in absolutely different way and uh, i would say that 40 if not more percent of the lesson is somewhere you know working with technologies it's interesting and uh, uh, no separate course on that it's a, it just is there like in real life but the problem is that education is one of the most conservative things ever, you know. And uh, it's not easy to, I, when I was in, in previous legislation, uh, I was rapporteur and report education in digital era. And uh, when I worked at it, I realized that, okay, I have, I'm going personal just to bring you an example. I have five children. And uh, uh, between them, there is 18 years between the oldest and the youngest. Uh, and when I gave birth to these children with this 18 years uh, period, it was absolutely different environment. Everything was different, you know, hospital was different, attitude was different, everything. But school is absolutely the same. I went to school in 1973 and my child, child is going to school now. It's absolutely the same. Attitude, environment, everything. And this is so, uh, it's so boring, unbelievably boring. You know? uh, but uh, it's not easy. To, to make the shift in the education. Well, this is, as I said, very conservative thing. And uh, we have maybe first to create demand from the side of parents. Well, you know, at the end of the day, school do, uh, does the things which parents require them to do. Hmm. And this is, of course, a, a huge dilemma. You mentioned a lot of um, YouTube and learning informally, and I think that's something that's a lot of young people and, you know, my niece and nephew are, for example, always on YouTube on their own time, learning how to draw certain things or, you know, how to build little mini robots. And I think, of course, some younger teachers are integrating this into their curriculum, but it is definitely a, a difficult shift to be made. Um, and you mentioned the creation of demand from parents. Do you think there should also be a creation, uh, the demand coming also from the kids themselves, saying we want to learn more this. Uh, absolutely, uh, absolutely. But the problem is that in some cultures, also in European Union, uh, nobody listens to the kids. Mm. You know, you, you, you can you can speak when you are eighteen and you are getting married. Now I'm listening to you. You know, this is like like it is. And uh, uh, maybe, maybe yes, I was thinking maybe you can involve more young people really into your uh, into your work. Finally, they will maybe. Sorry, my young people came home with my dog, and they call it home office, you know. <laughs> no, and, and it's uh, it's interesting how you mentioned nobody listens to kids. I guess nobody listens to kids unless unless you're Greta Thunberg or you're you're one of these, you know. It, kind of you kind of become an influencer in a, in a way in, in a certain domain but um, I think hopefully there's a bit of a shift to listening more to children at this time but uh, I have I've, to admit one uh, sorry interrupted you that during work on this report on digital education you know I, I would say that uh, my my children's uh, input there is like maybe half uh, but uh, and they were they were very surprised when I came and asked I want to have your legislative proposal, and they gave me. Wonderful. That's fantastic. I, I think, no, I mean, go ahead. I, you, you said this very, very directly, but I, I, I'm struck by how much it resonates to me, the fact that school hasn't changed, not, as, not in my lifetime. And when I look at my children who grow up in a different culture from where I grew up, but the principles are still the same. We have the teacher at the front who knows what's right, the kids at the back who have to uh, understand what's right. And yes, I agree that it, it's boring. It doesn't work particularly well, um, but it, it, it's extremely difficult to change. And I, and I think universities are maybe not quite as bad, but also very conservative institutions. Um, so it, we find it difficult to change. But we always have this thing like exchange of best practices. And now I'm just uh, uh, in the morning, I wrote a letter to a previous school of my son who studied in Estonia. And just, I wanted to create some kind of exchange of practices for. This is doable. Now I see how this is doable. If in integrated humanities, they are watching videos with, I don't know, uh, Stephen Fry debating, and they are going, wow, it's so interesting. But if, they, if they, you give them this uh, thin book with, I don't know, ah, no, they're sleeping. But OK, it will take time, of course. It will take time. Yeah. Um, I wonder uh, if, and so it seems in general like the model you're, you're talking about is more of a holistic model as well and, and 
I wonder if we could touch on the gap also that could be that could come about if we created a model in, for example, a curriculum that had, you know, a lot of these elements of ethical AI, but they were only available to the richer subset of society and that the poor subset who doesn't already have access to Wi-Fi, who doesn't have access to a more um, maybe up-to-date curricula would be left behind. So maybe we can touch on that a little bit, this gap that uh, could present itself. Absolutely. This was, uh, this was uh, my argument and it was supported largely in the parliament. Everybody understands this. I'm deeply convinced that, you know, this uh, lack of digital skills uh, is the ground for future social division. It's absolutely clear. And when, you know, when I started at school, my mother used to say to me that you have to study well, otherwise you will be working like a cleaning lady. And now uh, this argument is not relevant anymore, for we will not obviously have cleaning ladies if something bad will not happen, right? We will have robots or whatever, you know, operators of cleaning robots and so on and so forth. And so now if I uh, argue with my younger son, I thought, look, you have to... Uh, work well, otherwise you will clean streets somewhere in Calcutta. You know, uh, it's, this is another thing. You know, and yes, you're right, absolutely. But how to do it, again, you know, we have to work at, 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 at local level, at uh, level of me member states and so on. But there is some kind of, you know, I see my colleagues, some of them just don't trust this kind of thing. Politicians who are starting their working day uh, reading paper, newspaper, uh, they just, you know, this is something which is so uncomfortable and so unclear and why should we? And uh, this is a problem. Absolutely. I, I was wondering also if we could touch on the role of the industry in, uh, in training and education. And, and of course, we talked about parents, we've talked about kids themselves, and we've talked about the policy level, but what could industry leaders do to, to help make this a possibility for us or help to bolster the curriculum development in this area? You know, this is this old debate about matching skills and jobs, you know. Uh, I believe that all kind of cooperation between educational, uh, I don't know, school universities and uh, industries is very welcome, you know. Just uh, entrepreneurship, all kind of, these kind of things. It will be absolutely great to get, to give children opportunity, or children, pupils, opportunity to, to do something, to understand how it works in real life. For, you know, uh, and uh, uh, another thing which we have definitely to do in the education, you know, we have to get rid of this old paradigm of, okay, I will study, I will get diploma, and I will work uh, this profession till I retire. It will never happen again. We have learned again and again and again, and this is absolutely normal that if you're 50 plus and you go to university and you learn something absolutely new and so on. But educational system does not help to understand this. And it is in some, in some cases, of course. But you are right in, in this most, I would say, maybe, maybe more wealthy, more, more open-minded and so on. But, uh, and I believe that, okay, I'm going too political, but uh, I believe that this is partly the reason of all kind of uh, right for um, uh, populism. And so if people feel that they're left behind, they protest. No, absolutely, absolutely. Any comments, Bernd, on that? Uh, of course, we've, we've circled a lot of subject matters related to education. Um, maybe we can talk a bit more about the reskilling of the workforce, but uh, did you have any comments as well, I was wondering? Well, I think the, the, the question of the role of industry is also important because in, certainly in the digital world and in, in the field of AI and related technologies, industry is where the knowledge sits. You know, it's, it's no longer in the universities, it's no longer in, in research institutes, the cutting edge sits in Google, in Facebook, in you know, the, the big companies. And uh, th there's a question of how they interpret their, their uh, social responsibility with regards to these technologies. And I think that translates uh, into the question of, of education. Having, I mean, they, they, they are very active in, in various educational um, domains, um, but I think that there's an interesting question to, to what degree or they could be, uh, could be doing even more and how that relates to uh, other interests because there's also a lot of skepticism towards industry and a lot of people are particularly worried about the the, the power the economic and and the uh, also the political power of, of the big um, tech companies and so how do we square that how do we make sure that they can contribute to the the, uh, the greater good of society um, while at the same time not dominating society 
may I ask, uh, I, I remember that you were asking, but I just want to ask, uh, what do you think this pandemic, uh, okay, before pandemic there was like 5.7, if I remember correctly, people in European Union working, uh, doing telework. Now it's like almost 40%. And definitely, this will not decline to the level that it was before pandemic. What do you think this uh, uh, raise of teleworking, will it uh, change the attitude towards uh, IT and uh, this kind of things, in the, or it will be the same? Will it already has. Right? So, so I, I do agree that it's unlikely to go back to where it was before. Um, I think people have realized that um, you know, it offers opportunities that are sometimes positive not always uh, but i also think it, it this comes back to what uh, the point that anya pointed to earlier namely the digital divides the inequalities now there are some people who can telework who, uh, who are like me who have a place to do a, a good connection who, the, the skills to do it who benefit immensely from it and and, and uh, i think it has a, a big um, possibility of exacerbating the divides that we already have uh, the, the, the poor get left behind even further you can also mention the fact that there's been also a lot of studies recently about the mental health strain on uh, on teleworking, but that's that's a whole other a whole other element. Um, when it comes to teleworking and, and the technologies, we've already seen in the past how many months? Uh, nine, ten months, almost a year. The amount of advances that technologies that we use have made. Zoom has a whole bunch of new features, for example, uh, a lot of other technologies as well. So they are trying to keep keep up with uh, our our needs and our and our uh, wants but again i don't necessarily think that we're thinking of all of the oh, we, we had a an issue with the ethical um aspects of, of zoom specifically i remember with the data breaches but uh, we're not thinking all of the time day to day of all of these uh, specific technologies that we're looking into and that we have to sign up for um and give our consent for them to use our data as well so that's a uh, another issue uh was discussing this with some other people yesterday, um, how we're constantly asked to give our consent for all these different platforms and have different passwords and all these things. And we don't have the option to just opt out or just give the bare, bare minimum. And this is a, another issue, I guess, that comes into more of a GDPR aspect of things. Uh, no, this is also a kind of uh, off topic, but not, not, not 100% off topic. I'm dealing with a report right to disconnect right now which means that, you know, uh, and uh, uh, this disaster was going on with this pandemic, you know. People are working like 12 and 14 hours a day without even having a lunch break. That's what I was speaking that, you know, we don't have these ethical borders yet. And uh, there is a feeling that if you work from home, this is kind of not work. This is you at home, so please pick my phone and answer my letter. And this home office where grandmother is drinking tea and dog is barking and children are crying and you are working in, in, in the middle of this disaster, you know, and it's absolutely unbelievable what's going on. And then there's no regulation at all. Mm. So I believe that this is kind of in all fields uh, as we are moving so fast forward due to the pandemic now. Yeah. Yes, I think that, that, that those are some of the downsides. Uh, what, what struck me most, though, when, when the pandemic started and we all went online was that it was possible. Uh, that that the, the the technology is there was there prior to the pandemic, and was able to to take up the slack and and facilitate this. And I really, I mean, ten years ago, I don't think this would have worked. It would have been impossible. We couldn't have connected. There wasn't Zoom. It, it just wouldn't have been possible. Now it is possible. I think, which is great in many respects. But the, the points you make are, of course, perfectly valid. Now, now we need to think about how do we organize this. How, how do we make sure that people don't self-exploit, get exploited, and all this sort of thing. Yeah, there's also a gender aspect as well with this as well. Uh, a lot of the time, you know, the female male divide and the fact that women have a lot of unpaid work that is on top of the work that adds to their to their workday. So uh, it could also be the male. We're not excluding that, but often it does uh, lend to uh, add to the female's workload. So, OK, um, I wonder if we could just touch on um, just very, very briefly, I know we discussed the reskilling of the workforce. I don't know if you had anything additional that you'd like to add, Jana, uh, on this point, as you are, I know you are involved in the, the Committee of Employment and Social Affairs. So is there anything we could be doing or creating from the research support perspective? Uh, you know, I'm not, not the right people for you to discuss. For if I think about reskilling, I'm coming from Estonia, as I said, we have Idovarama County with this oil shale miners. 
And now due to this is problem all over Europe with this green deal, uh, we're losing jobs and we have to rescue people. But I can hardly imagine a minor, let's say 52 years old, uh, who will be uh, rescued as a programmer, for instance, or something like that. It's not very realistic, I'm, I'm afraid. So first, if, I, if we're speaking about reskilling, uh, maybe we have to reskill these people who, who have to work with digital tools, whose work requires it, and so on. But if we're speaking about creating new jobs, so to say, from zero, I don't see the big potential for those who will lose jobs in... Uh, I don't know, 10, 15 years in Europe. I would not be very optimistic. For young generation, definitely. But for these uh, older, I'm kind of really concerned about them. No, absolutely. I think when it comes to, as well, the employment factor, when we talk about young people and we talked about the continuing education aspects, and if we know that every five years we should be doing some kind of online course or it's built into our working life, uh, that could be much easier to reach a quick shift in our job but when it comes to um, the way it currently is then it's not necessarily going to happen for people who are in their 40s or in their, in their 50s trying to trying to totally shift their uh, their jobs but also you know our understanding of digital skills is very different when we discuss it in the parliament uh, I was also always asking, let's, let's put on the paper set of required digital skills. And this list always starts with uh, be able to send an email. I'm very sorry, this is not a skill anymore. You know, this is like you know, skill to write on the paper, it's the same basic. You know? And uh, uh, this self-evaluation of digital skills is also, also very different. And uh, maybe we can agree on European level to which, I don't know, to what digital skills we have to, what, what has to be the goal. I understand that it's always, I'm contradicting myself for everything will change maybe in two years, but still we are lagging behind like I would say 10 years or so in our approach in, in Europe. And what we call uh, teleworking here in Brussels or in Estonia, this is two different uh, things, you know. We're not even allowed to in, install to our computers in the parliament, this Estonian ID software. And if we need to vote there, guess what we do? We print out voting lists, fill them with pen, scan them, and then send them back, these emails with scans. And they call it teleworking. <laughs> they call it digital solution. Now, this is absolutely unbelievable. We're in 21st century. And uh, this is extremely time consumption. You, you understand. Uh, but at the same time, we are very uneven in these things in Europe. If we look at the figures uh, about teleworking during pandemic, in Romania it was like less than 10%, I think, due to the fact that they just don't have this infrastructure, they don't have these possibilities. And somewhere in, I don't remember, it was somewhere in Northern, Northern Europe, Finland maybe, it was more than 80%. Hmm. So European approach is uh, like temperature in the hospital, you know, some are dead, some are sick, and in the middle, we have 36 and 6. Okay, well, we have a few minutes left. Uh, Bern, do we have any final questions from your side? From your perspective, as somebody who, who clearly has thought about these, uh, these questions and these issues, and uh, why maybe not a subject expert per se knows about what the discussion ha is in, in Parliament, what do you think the most important thing would be that policymakers should do at this point? Mm -hmm. I, I strongly believe in this uh, uh, ethical aspect. I really do. Uh, I think that without it, we will be, and of course, this build of trust, really. And uh, uh, people who are dealing with AI, I mean, from, so to say, from the side of ordinary people, they have to understand that they are dealing with AI at the moment, that this is both speaking to me or my diagnosis was uh, made by, uh, with AI and so on and so forth. And of course, uh, uh, people have to, be, uh, to agree with it. We cannot kind of manipulate them, which is sometimes the case. You know. Even now, when you go on the site and you see somebody, oh, I'm Joanna, can I help you? And I know people who do not realize that Joanna is not a lovely girl on the other side of the screen. Mm -hmm. So it has to be very clear that we have to put the source on place, definitely. And, uh, 
of course, rule of law and human rights and all these kind of things. Unfortunately, we don't have Silicon Valley in Europe, you know. And, uh, uh, but we have uh, big ambitions uh, in the rule of law things, which is right, of course, but we are not competitors in the world, in the field of digital technologies and artificial intelligence. And it's uh, not easy to set the rules if you are not competitive. Yes, there is, of course. I mean, we haven't touched on this, but the whole question of uh, the, the global landscape of these technologies. Now, we've very much talked about the EU, but you're right, of course, they don't come from the EU. A lot of the technologies come from America. Uh, China is a big player, and they have very different uh, frameworks, different uh, legislative environment, different moral perceptions and, and preferences. Yeah. But maybe then we have to look at how we are regulating uh, internet as such, or sometimes we're over-regulating the things, and our startups who were very successful, they just moved to America. So it's much more easier to comply with their requirements than with ours. So we are contradicting ourselves in this field. Well, they, 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 I, I, I think you're, you're right. This is a, a very difficult balance to strike. And on the one hand, we, we want to uphold uh, human rights um, and for good reasons. Um, so, which may require oversight, which may require um, enforcement of, of rules. On the other hand, of course, we don't want, don't want to stifle innovation. We want to give people the freedom to to succeed. And, and, and how, how do we? Where, where exactly do we stri strike the balance? But I wish you good luck. You have very ambitious um, thing to do. So, fingers crossed. Thank, Thank you, you very you much. So much.